a, a very nice opportunity to take at this contact again. So uh, I will talk today to you about four papers. <laughs> in, in one hour, I will try to talk up with you about four papers related to mixed formulations for eigenvalue problems in elasticity, linear elasticity and uh, fluid mechanics. So here are the four topics of the talk. I will not take so long to talk about all, all these four topics. But uh, I will start with the elasticity in value problem uh, with an a priori analysis. Uh, then I will uh, talk about a, a posteriori error analysis for the same problem in the topic one. And three are, and four are related to the Stokes in value problem. All these uh, problems are in mixed formulations based in, uh, in a pseudo stress formulation. Okay, I, I will talk about this in the forthcoming slides. So this is the elasticity and value problem. This is a classic problem. Uh, we will work in two and three dimensions and consider a polygonal domain uh, with boundary uh, partial omega here. We consider uh, this domain as a Lipschitz domain. So the problem is to find a sigma here, which is the Cauchy tensor. Uh, U is the displacement of the structure. Uh, lambda and mu here are the lambda coefficients, and kappa here is the Higgins value that I will try to to characterize and to approximate together with the Higgins functions. For this problem in particular, we consider um, Dirichlet uh, boundary conditions on the whole domain, despite to the fact that we can consider, of course, um, uh, mixed formulations. Neumann and, and Dirichlet together, but in this paper in particular, uh, we consider only Dirichlet. Okay, here, um, this uh, bar epsilon here is the usual uh, tensor of small deformations defined uh, as the symmetric part of the gradient, of course. So the idea here is to reformulate this problem in an alternative way, which is the following. Doing some algebraic manipulations uh, we can derive that the divergence of the Cauchy tensor is exactly this quantity here, the Laplacian of the uh, displacement plus the Lamé coefficients of the gradient of the divergence of the displacement. And we can rewrite the problem, uh, the previous problem as this one here. And the idea here is to introduce this pseudo stress tensor. This idea is not my idea. This idea was incorporated in the paper of Professor Gatica and their collaborators here. And they uh, use this formulation for the source problem, for the load problem. So I think I thought in the moment that for the spectral problem can, problem can be suitable uh, to study the elasticity of the problem because mixed formulations um, are good in the sense that um, are looking free when we, we are talking about numerical methods. The numerical methods and mixed formulations are looking free. And we have the problem with the lambda coefficient here because uh, if the Poisson ratio uh, goes to one half, lambda here uh, goes to infinity. So the standard numerical methods uh, are uh, uh, locking uh, phenomenon. Okay, so the idea of the mixed formulations in, uh, in the first place is that, to so avoid the locking phenomenon. So with this pseudo stress tensor, we write this problem here, where now the pseudo stress is written in the terms of the equation, in the first equation. The divergence of, uh, of the pseudo stress now is equal to the uh, kappa times the displacement, and we have the same uh, Diglett condition. Okay, we have some other identities which are very useful for the posterior analysis in, in particular. For example, we have a, uh, an expression for the gradient uh, in terms of the pseudo stress. So the incorporation of the pseudo stress tensor is not only because we, have, we can have a mixed formulation, also relates another quantities that could be inter interesting, uh, such as the, the gradient of the displacement. So with this identity here, the aging value problem that we will study is this final system here, okay? So for the analysis of this problem, we proceed uh, with a mixed formulation, which we obtain by uh, multiplying these equations with uh, 
uh, suitable uh, test functions integration by parts with the green identities. And the final uh, formulation is this one, is uh, it's a saddle point problem, where uh, I think in the Acta Numerica of this uh, problem is the second type, uh, a value problem, where the pseudo stress we find in this a tensorial HD space and the displacement we find in this L2 as vectorial L2 space. So these bi bilinear forms here are the final here of uh, this is the, the bilinear form A, and we have a bilinear form B. And actually, if we introduce this deviator te uh, tensor here, the tau upper D here, we can rewrite the bilinear form A as the last equation here, where the lambda coefficient now is only in the denominator of this fraction here. Okay, so with this bilinear form, we will work. Uh, okay, to, an to analyze this problem, we will decompose the HD uh, space as this uh, direct sum with a space H0, R time, the identity, where H0 is the space of functions in H with a trace null. Okay, this is for to. Uh, to ensure the uniqueness of solution of the elasticity problem. And the constants here can be characterized by this expression here. Okay, this was also proved in the paper of Professor Gatica and, their, and his collaborations. So we need to now establish that this problem, the agent value problem is well posed. So we have in one hand, the coercivity result and an in condition. To obtain this coercivity result, we need this bound for deviators here. It's a very standard. We can find it in any mixed uh, uh, book, for example, the Resi 14 uh, book. And the coercivity and mixed condition was already proven in the, in the paper of Professor Gatica. So we, with these tools at hand, we can incorporate the solution operator that will uh, connect the source problem with the hand value problem. And Please kindly see here that we have a T with a subindex lambda. This is important because we are solving a family of eigenvalue problems because if we change this parameter lambda, the spectrum of the operator will change. So we have a family of problems here. And this is why I denote the solution operator with this lambda here. So this operator uh, establishes that given an F a uh, source F, we can obtain a U, U hat, which is the solution of this source problem here, okay? The, the, one of the important ingredients here to uh, analyze these problems are the regularity of the agent functions, which are given by the paper of Grisvard here, where the agent functions have this regularity, okay? And we have to make uh, this assumption here. This assumption is not so natural to do because in the paper here, uh, I don't know if you can see a paper of, I did with Salim Medahi and Rodolfo Rodriguez for, DG, for a DG discretization of the uh, elasticity problem. We realized that the the, 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 the elasticity, the, the, the numerical method converges with no problem, independently of lambda, and we didn't know how the or, or why actually the, the the these regularity exponents were not affected by lambda. Okay, so that that's an open question: why this constant here and this regularity exponent are not affected by the changes of uh, of lambda? So. For the analysis, we did this assumption here, which we cannot prove uh, at the moment, but works for what we want to do. So the, with this assumption and with this regularity of agent functions, we have that the operator T lambda here is compact, is regularizing, and hence we have a spectral characterization for the problem, okay? With this spectral characterization, 
we are in position to, to make a numerical analysis for this problem. <clears throat> Other thing that we are interested in here is the limit problem. What happens when the Poisson, ra Poisson ratio goes to one half? If, I, if you allow me to see here, when the Poisson ratio goes to one half, lambda goes to infinity. So this term here in the bilinear form A vanishes and only remains the first term here with the deviators. So, what happened here? Uh, something happened? Okay. I will show you my slides in this way. I, I don't know what happened with the cursor. So, the limit problem now is a more simple problem because as I told you, uh, I, we don't have this term with the, the ends and the Lamy coefficients. But, the, pro, but the, the question is, what happens with the spectrum of this problem? When uh, lambda goes to one half, the spectrum of T lambda converges to the, to, to the spectrum of this T infinity operator here. And the answer is yes, we have the, the convergence of this operator and hence the making values and making functions converge each other, okay? And we have this theorem here of the separation of the spectrum when this fact is established. So now we are in a position to, to write or to present the R mixed element discretization. In this case, we only consider the Rabiatoma elements of uh, degree K uh, because for simplicity only. And, and actually the paper of Professor Gatica uh, works with Rabiatoma elements. Maybe we can use BDM elements, for instance, to discretize HD, but we use the simpler, uh, the most simple elements here. We define it first by as vectors, and then we define it as tensors where each row or each column, uh, sorry, each column of the, of the tensor is a, a Ravier domain. This is for to, this is to approximate the pseudo stress and to approximate the displacement. We only use uh, polynomials of degree K in each, uh, in each element. Since we have this H zero pro, uh, space, we discretize, discretize that, that space with the Ragartoma also, and we denote it by H, H0 here. Some, uh, oh, what happened here? Some um, uh, approximation properties for the Ragartoma interpolation operator are given here. And this is a key ingredient here. This, this, uh, the, this finite element satisfies this commutative diagram. So we can only, uh, this allows us to control the L2, nor only the L2 norm of the human function instead of the entire H deep norm, okay? So the discrete human value problem here is this one. We, can, we need to prove the same properties of discrete coercivity, discrete in subcondition uh, and the coercivity of course in the kernel of this bilinear form here. And then uh, we need to uh, introduce the, uh, the discrete solution operator, which I've been introduced here because I'm leading immediately to this result here that is the approximation between the continuous operator and the discrete operator. Notice that here I'm not, uh, I'm dropping the sub index lambda only for simplicity, but we have this. Um, this result. So we, uh, in, in fact, um, we are using here the compact operator theory because the solution operator results to be compact. So the babuska osborn theory is enough to uh, establish the convergence of eigen values and eigen functions, of course. And with these um, um, definitions of the gap of between eigen, uh, space between spaces, we can prove the convergence of Eichen functions and a linear convergence of the Eichen values with this quantity here, D sub k, D sub kappa. And this is important to do because we are dealing with a family of problems. So if we are working with 
a particular choice of lambda, we need to approximate this, the spectrum related to this particular, pro, this particular lambda and with no other lambda. So we need to separate the eigenvalues values correctly in order to approximate what, what is needed to be approximated. So this distance here exactly uh, delivers us this, um, this condition that we can separate the eigenvalues values from another kinds of a spectrum depending on lambda. We can improve the, this, um, this, uh, um, this result here with a, a double order of approximation depending on, again on this distance. And we have the sketch of the proof here. It's very simple. We, can, we, we use this ident algebraic identity. We use the, this bound for the term uh, with the trace with the traces and then appears naturally the errors of the pseudo stress and the displacement and then we can which are uh, actually the, the, here are the errors which are um, obtained with of course the theorem here with this part of the theorem the approximation of the Asian functions Okay, so this is the entire analysis. Of course, we have a lot of mathematics to do here and algebraic things, but uh, this is the main, the key ingredients. And of course, we need to um, to test this uh, the method when in, in a computer. We use a Phoenix code. Uh, actually, Phoenix is very popular right now, and of course, we are using this. Um, this software to, do, to our experiments. And we prove the method with different values of the coefficient nu. Observe that we can, uh, we can get the, the Poisson ratio equal to one half, okay? Because since it's a mixed formulation, the, the terms with the lambdas vanishes and we can work with no problems with the limit case. And we observe that we have the quadratic order in for the for the approximation. This uh, and we can we can compare all the eigenvalues values that we compute with different kinds of meshes here, where this n is the the quantity of sides in the x a in the in the abscissa. I don't remember how I said, it, but we we can. Uh, measure this end with in some way, and we compare our Asian values, com where our computer Asian values with extrapolated Asian values that we obtain with a less square fitting. Okay, this was proved for the lowest order, k equals zero in different uh, values of nu, but we can also consider in Phoenix different uh, degrees of polynomials, the polynomial degrees, we use k, k equal, equal one and k equal two. And we observe that the conversions also holds for uh, different um, steps of measure, uh, steps of measures, okay? Here we have uh, some nice plots of the Asian functions. We have plotting the magnitude of the displacement actually. We prove this also in a three-dimensional domain if we have a unit cube with different values of the Poisson ratio, and of and again, the quadratic order is clearly obtained here in this column. Okay, and we have some other plots of the magnitude of the displacement together with the deformations of the structure. If, we, if you can see here, we have, we are trying to show the deformations of the structure in in the cube. It was obtained with a new equal 0 0.49 and k equal one. The other thing that we do is the uh, a posteriori error analysis. And for this, the idea is to recover the optimal order when the, the aging functions are not smooth enough. And this lack of a smoothness is because of maybe geometrical features of the domain or maybe physical quantities that leads to a lack of, um, of the smoothness of the Aiken functions. So to do this, uh, first we need to introduce some notations and definitions. For, for example, the set of um, edges in, inside the domain, the edges in the, in the boundary, 
uh, the jump of the normal component of each tensor, okay, in order to develop the analysis. But we are dealing, dealing with a mixed formulation for the eigenvalue problem. A classic approach to study the a posteriori error analysis for eigenvalue problems was given in a paper of Ricardo Duran and Claudio Padra, and I think we also, I think with Rodolfo Rodriguez also, when they proved that if for the Laplacian operator at least, at the mixed formulation for the Laplacian operator, uh, for the eigenvalue problem, then discretize with Ray Thomas, for example, and then they consider an auxiliary problem which is equivalent to the discretization for HD, but with a non-conforming method, as for instance the Crusoe Rabia. Okay, why they do that or they did that? Uh, it's because they need to control the high order terms that naturally appear in the um, in the uh, a posterior error analysis for uh, human problems. That's one idea. So with uh, Gonzalo and Jesus, we were thinking about which are the spaces, non-conforming spaces that we need to do the same thing as the paper of Duran. And then we arrived to another approach. This, uh, this uh, investigator here, Hia Chen, and I don't know how to say this last name, Chie, maybe, they, they, they uh, propose a post-processing operator in order to control the high order terms. For this, they need to uh, define uh, the patch of, uh, the, the patch in from, with respect to some vertex of any triangle and define this operator here, which is defined as the sum of all the contributions of on the patch uh, multiplied by, one half the measure of the batch. So it's like a, an average, okay? With this operator, they prove this lemma here. And this in particular is the one we need, this, this control of this error. And then the local indicator is this atrocity here, but with this term here. When you see another paper of a posterior error analysis for the problems, you will see that appears in some parts, uh, lambda h, u, h, minus lambda h, u in a norm. So that's a high order term that you need to control. In this case, this not appear and appears this term here, which is very easily to control because of the lemma here. And of course, this is the local indicator and this is the global indicator. And for the limit problem, we have a local indicator and a global indicator as well, okay? When, I, I will not uh, say much about the analysis of this because we need to prove the reliability and efficiency. The efficiency is proved with the aid of bubble functions in three and two dimensions. And the reliability is obtained uh, directly from the fact that this upper, this a posterior error estimator is residual type, okay? But we proved that the error and the estimator are equivalent. And, and that's the idea uh, on the, the main idea uh, on the a posterior analysis in general. So uh, as you can see here in the reliability, the a posterior error estimator is bounded below by the error. And with efficiency, the a posterior error estimator is bounded above from the, with, with the error. Of, this, th these results are for the full problem, but of course for the limit problem, the results remain are the same. So we don't have to do any other computations we, with the full problem is enough. And then for the numerical experiments, uh, well, here I have the definitions of lambda nu, maybe I, <laughs> uh, uh, I was better to uh, show it in the first slides, but now it's proved here. And the algorithm for the a posterior error analysis to solve, estimate, mark, and refine. Okay, so we first solve the eigen value problem, we make an estimation, we mark where we want to, where are the problems, and then we refine in the part where the problems are. And this algorithm, algorithm uh, was the, is actually, is the one provided by Verfield in this classical 
a reference for a, a, a posteriori error analysis. So how we prove this in a three-dimensional three domain, we have an L shape in, three, in 3D. Of course, in this part, we have the singularity of the geometry. And because of this re-entrant angle, the, the Aachen functions of the elasticity problem are not smooth enough. So the order of convergence with the a priori analysis is not optimal. So the, the order of convergence is not, is not optimal. We, op we expect that with this a posteriori uh, uh, estimator, we can achieve again this optimal order. And this is what happens. We prove the estimator with different values of the Poisson ratio, okay? We, we compare the uniform refinement versus the adaptive refinement, and we observe in, a, in all of these cases that the error uh, decays as we expect. So the optimal order is at, uh, attained, and we have here a plot of the effect, effectivity indexes that are typical in the numerical in, in the numerical analysis for a posterior error estimators. And here we have plots of the refinement that is performed by our a posteriori indicators. We be, uh, observe that if this is the initial mesh here and we start to refine here, and maybe it's not so clear, but observe that when we are in the eight, 12, 17, and final step of the refinement, in this case for nu equals 0 0.35, in here, I will make a zoom, here we are performing an adaptive refinement as we expect the a posteriori indicator does. In this case, I also observe. And, and the other, observe here that the theta L ratio are bigger than the ones here in the singularity. So the, the a posteriori indicator um, is, is capable to um, to identify where needs to be refined the, the domain, okay? And that's it about the elasticity problem. Of course, I can speak a lot, a lot of time about this problem. We will, I want to talk about other things also. Here, I want to talk now so about the Stokes problem. Uh, the Stokes second value problem is the one I like most instead of elasticity problem. I don't know why, maybe I think it's because it's simpler. Uh, here we are considering the Stokes eigenvalue problem where we need to find the velocity, the pressure, the corresponding eigenvalue. We are working in two and three dimensions with a simply connected polygonal domain with boundary partial omega. We, we consider as a Lipschitz dom, uh, boundary again, the, the, boundary, the boundary here. New is the kinematic viscosity. And this problem was, I'll, I think, full studied in this paper, Lovadina, Lilian, Stenberg, for the posterior estimates uh, for the Stokes and Hinvalley problem. <clears throat> in fact, in this reference, they have an, an extra ingredient, which is the, a mixed, um, how do you say, um, a mixed boundary conditions. Okay, they have Dirichlet and Neumann conditions. In this case, we only consider Dirichlet conditions, but in the computational part, uh, we can do whatever we want. Actually. But for the analysis, we have the simpler thing. In this case, we also will uh, derive a mixed formulation for the problem, again, with the aid of this pseudo stress tensor, which in this context of the Stokes problem, we define as two times new and the gradient of u minus the pressure. Observe that here the pseudo sort of stress tensor relates the displacement, the velocity, in, uh, more precisely the, the gradient of the velocity and the pressure. So if we compute sigma here, we can obtain more information about the fluid related to the pressure and its gradient. So the pseudo sort of stress, stress classic formulation is this one here which we uh, multiply by test functions and multi uh, integrate by parts and all the fabulous things that we do always. And we obtain this variational formulation here, okay? Where we need to find the pseudo stress, the pressure and the velocity and these spaces here. 
Okay, it's a very similar uh, formulation compared with the elasticity, because we are all, again using the deviator tensors. Uh, we have these terms with divergence, which are which will correspond to bilinear forms B. It's again a second time eigenvalue problem because the eigenvalue is in the second equation, and we have all these term here, it's, uh, which we need to control in some way. This uh, stress classic formulation here was already studied by Ayen, Professor Gabriel Gatica, who is an expert in mixed methods, but for the source problem. So again, we, say, we saw that for eigenvalue problems could be a very interesting thing to do, and we did, we did this analysis. Again, we decompose the space HD in this direct sum to establish the uniqueness of the solution. And we define bilinear forms A and B, which are A is the, this one and B are the divergence parts. And we have this other point problem, okay? In fact, here appears a parameter uh, gamma, which we consider as one if N is, uh, the dimension is two, and three and a half if the dimension is three. This was also needed for the source problem as Professor Gatica proved in, in his paper. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know, how, I don't know what happened. Uh, okay. Where I was, where I was. I was here, okay. So, Observe that in this formulation, we have the pressure, okay? The pressure is related in, with this equation. In fact, P plus one over N, the trace of sigma is equal to zero. So we can avoid this term here and obtain a more uh, simple formulation, okay? That's what we are trying to do here because we have the velocity servo stress formulation where only the velocity and the pseudo stress are the main unknowns of the, of the mixed problem. And here we have the full problem where we have the pressure, the, 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 the pseudo stress tensor and the velocity. We can work with any of these two problems in fact, because if we solve here, this one, we can obtain, the, we can recover the pressure with a post-process given by this equation here. So, we can compute directly the pressure with the velocity pressure of service stress formulation, or we can compute the pressure with a post-processing with a velocity service stress formulation. Any of these two are suitable to work with fine, mixed and finite elements. In fact, we can prove that at continuous level, these two problems are equivalent, which is stated in this red, uh, in this red thing. This problem is well posed. So you have the insub condition and the coercivity on the kernel of five linear form B. And that allows us to introduce the, again, the solution operator, which is compact in this case. Of, of course, uh, is self adjoint, is, uh, is well defined because of the Babus Cabresi theory, and is, re and is regularizing because it's um, defined between L2 and L2. Okay, and L2 is compactly embedded in L2. So the, the operator is compact in the same sense as the elasticity problem. So we have a, here, uh, we have a, a spectral characterization for T, which is actually the same as the elasticity equation, which is, co which is co uh, where the gen values corresponds to a sequence of positive again values converging to zero, okay? But we need to make a trick here. We need to define another uh, solution operator. We denoted by T tilde. And why is that? We here say that at continuous level, the problems are equivalent. That doesn't happen at, con at the discrete level. It's not possible to prove that at the discrete level the, so the problems are equivalent. So if we want to study at the discrete level this problem and this problem, okay, we cannot 
discretize the same operator for the two uh, for, for the two problems. So we need to incorporate an auxiliary problem, an auxiliary operator, which corresponds to work with a, in one part with a full problem and the other part with a velocity cellus, velocity cellus stress problem. In this case, the solution operator T tilde has the same properties as the T. So we can avoid all this uh, boring thing. But we have a theorem here about the um, regularity of the solution and the spectral characterization for each one of these operators. So we are in position to um, we're in position to uh, write a, a finite element method for this. Okay, uh, this is important. Maybe I, I didn't say that, but in these uh, mixed formulations of high order approximations, we need to have the, the divergence of the civil stress needs to be more regular. Okay, it's not enough H1. We need a little more. Okay, to define correctly the traces of the of these functions on the boundary. Okay, so in this case, in this paper in particular, we have a comp we take two families of finite elements. In one hand, we have the Robert Thomas, and the other hand, we have the BDM elements. Okay, both spaces are conforming for HT. The question is, which one is better? Of course. I think, um, no, I don't think nothing. <laughs> uh, please see here that we defined the tensorial Robert Thomas uh, element in the same sense as the elasticity equation and the residual class Marini are only polynomials of degree k, equal, uh, but vectorial. Okay. We introduced these notations for uh, spaces where we approximate the pseudo stress, the pressure and the velocity. And of course, the mix it, um, no, the product space. In this, uh, for this um, uh, finite elements, we have approximations uh, of the interpolations, which are basically the same as in elasticity. And we have these two discrete problems. The first one discretized the velocity of stress pressure and the second one the velocity of stress problem okay we need to study separately these two problems because the the lack of equivalence between these two discrete problems okay so we define for each uh, operator t and t tilde the corresponding discrete counterpart which which um, solves the corresponding discrete uh, source problem and again, we have we need to come, we need to prove that th converge to t in the corresponding norm. In this case, it's only an L two norm. And why is that? It's enough because Rabiar Thomas and BDM these families satisfies the, the the commutative diagram property. So we don't need to control the divergence here. We only need to control the L2 norm because these are op our solution operators are from L2 from L2. We don't need to define it from for the whole space. Okay. For T and T tilde, the results are exactly the same. Uh, and of course, all these quantities in the right hand side for each estimate can be approximated with the properties of the VDM or radiar Thomas interpolation operator and the L2 projection. Okay, this, has a, this is a consequence of, of course, of the classic theory of compact operators. And then we have a, an error estimates, which is um, derived directly from this lemma. We have now powers of H for each approximation. Uh, for, I'm sorry, for each problem, the tilde and not tilde problem, and for each family of the fi uh, finite elements, for uh, PK Rabiar Thomas and PK Vidia. We have the same properties. And finally, and something that I didn't say in the entire talk is that all these methods are spurious free. So we have the classic uh, result of Cato, where we establish this spurious free future of the uh, of the numerical method. And again, we can derive 
error estimates for the agent functions and for the agent values, and we can improve the order of conversions of the agent values with this quadratic order theorem here. Okay. And again, we perform numerical analysis for this. First, we consider this domain is the same domain as the considered in Lovadina and Medaji, Mora and Rodriguez. These are our reference, main references for our comparison. And we, for this, we are considering here the velocity pressure pseudo stress formulation uh, in this table for different approximation, uh, polynomial approximations. We observe that the quadratic order is attained again. All the agent values were computed for different size of meshes. We compare it with uh, extrapolated values, again, obtained with a less square fitting, and we compare our extrapolations with the references here, and we observe that very close. So for this scheme, with Rabiar Toma and the pseudo stress, the things apparently works very well. For the VDM case, these results are the same. For different polynomial degrees, we compute all our agent values. The quadratic order is clearly here attained, and our extrapolation values obtained with this scheme are again very close to the classic references here. So at least for the Unit for the square, the clamped square with two, um, with these two schemes to discretize the velocity pressure uh, pseudo stress formulation, the things work uh, very well. Here, here we have some plots for the velocity fields for uh, first, third, and fourth lowest energy values and the pressure fluctuations, of course. The colors here is because we are considering also the magnitude of the, of the velocity. Uh, ah, um, here we have the full scheme with the pressure incorporated. Of course, with only the velocity and the pseudo stress, the results are exactly the same. And rem uh, remember that we can recover the pressure uh, with a post-processing in this case. And in that case, where only the velocity and the solo stress is obtained. And the results are exactly the same, in fact. And we also proved the, the, the method in 3D, in a cube, in a sphere. And we observe here that for the two schemes, for the Ravier Toman VDM, the, the computation of the spectrum is perfect, I think. Uh, we have extrapolated values and the order of convergence is exactly two for the cube and for the sphere we have a, a, we have similar results okay well here observe that we have 3.4 3.5 so someone can ask uh, what happens with this order of convergence why is greater than two <clears throat> we think that well, that happens because we are approximating a curved domain with Tetraedra. So a covered domain with uh, straight edges um, lies to a, how do you say, um, variational crime. So maybe that is reflected here in these two orders. In the unit circle, it happens the same in two dimensions. Uh, but the order for key, K, 0, 1, 2, or whatever you want, is always 2 in the unit uh, disk. And here we have um, the, the velocity field and the pressure fluctuation on the cube for the second and fourth uh, associated to the second and fourth lowest agent values. And for the sphere, we have the same results, the velocity field and uh, the pressure fluctuations for the second and fourth lowest agent values. Okay. So the things here works apparently very well. And a final approach that we, I want to present to you is an alternative formulation for the Stokes agent value problem where now we are not depending only on the pressure, the velocity, and the solar stress, but now we are considering the vorticity, okay? So the distance or sigma depends on the vorticity here. This curl with this underline 
is related to, to uh, it's to represent the curl applied to the uh, vectorial fields and the curl with no underline is for uh, tensorial fields we, we want to differentiate uh, the curves depending on the field what we are working on again the pressure can be eliminated uh, with this um, relation here with this tau r defined by this expression here uh, this formulation was also invented by professor Gabriel Gatica. actually if you can if you can follow my idea his mixed formulations are very suitable for for him value problems i think so this was another idea to to prove the numerical methods in for example problems the, for, the variation of formulation is this one but since we are discretizing the h curve space we need to discretize this space with Nedelec elements okay we are considering Nedelec of first and second type which corresponds in the first type only a rotation of radiar tomar and for the second type and only rotations of the VDM elements. We are thinking only in two dimensions because we were wondering when we was studying this, uh, what means a rotation in 3D or a, a, VD, a radial toma or what means a rotation in 3D for a VDM element? It's not a clear answer. And that's why uh, the people involved in this kind of space is only working 2D, I think at least for the Stokes problem, because I'm, I, I, uh, I know that the Maxwell like value problem is differently. But with these spaces here are enough to discretize this problem over here, where the approximation properties are the same as the Rabiotoma and the VDM elements. So we are not inventing the wheel here, we are using the same tools as before. And we can prove the same results, which are approximation of the agent functions, the agent functions, the agent values, agent functions, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I say it in backwards, and, and a double order of convergence for the agent values. So since the results are similar, I will show you anything about that. And I don't want to, to bore you again uh, with, most, with, with more slides, but I can tell you, I can tell you that all this information that I present to you here, are contained in this uh, in, in these papers. Uh, we are waiting to this paper to be published very soon, at least in this year. And the Stokes and elasticity uh, a posterior analysis are contained in these uh, papers here. As you can see, my, my main collaborators in in these studies are Professor Gonzalo Rivera from Universidad de los Lagos in Osorno and Dr. Jesus Bellojin, who is a postdoc here in University of Yogyo. And Daniel Insunza, who is working in the INRIA Institute in Sofia Antipolis in France. So this is all I want to show you today. Thank you very much oh. for your attention. Uh, Dr. Lepe, thank you very much for this very interesting and uh, excellent talk. Uh, we, we, I hope I hope that was excellent. I hope <laughs> it was it was an extraordinary talk. Thank you very much once again. It was uh, very interesting. Now, um, of course, I, I have a couple of questions, but let us uh, first ask uh, the audience or our participants if they have any question. They are uh, very welcome to. Maybe they can give a reaction or they can write from the chat or I can uh, allow them to unmute the, themselves so that they can ask. And uh, while, while they are <laughs> preparing to ask, let me ask you, uh, I have a couple of questions. The, the, this, the, Please tell me. the sim simplest one, perhaps. You are using the Phoenix to, to validate your results right mm -hmm. um, and uh, what about the the eigenvalue solver are you using slipsy are you calling slipsy to get the eigenvalues or do you have any that, that's that's a question we, we, i need a jesus here because he's the man on on phoenix right now because when i was working for example in the dg programs my scheme of working was 
uh, construct the, matri the matrices in Phoenix and then put it in MATLAB and solve uh, with eggs. Okay. And, then and, and then recover. Uh, we know that uh, in Phoenix, the first agent solvers was very poor, actually, uh, was not very accurate to work. But Jesus was working a lot in that solver, and the, the results that he obtained are very accurate compared with the MATLAB codes and with the MATLAB uh, eggs, in, in fact. I think, uh, I don't know, Jesus if is here, and maybe he can... Uh, uh, Put the answer on, on the on the chat, but he's using um, the slepsy, I think, in one hand, and assemble. I, I don't know. It's Jesus who is the person there. Uh, uh, but I, I can tell you now that, for instance, in Phoenix, the results are uh, very accurate, and the agent solver in in particular jesus uh, has been working a lot in that and he has a refined uh, solver for phoenix so you uh, not only more efficient but you you say that the results of uh, the results you get from phoenix are more accurate than I, I think are similar to the eggs okay. I, I i i can i can i cannot tell you if are better or worse ah, but okay. are similar are, are similar, uh, are very accurate compared with the eggs of MATLAB. Okay, that was, that would be interesting to see what is the solver that is called from Phoenix. Uh, mm -hmm. I, actually, I, maybe you, you you know something about Phoenix, but for example, for um, the implementation of the a posteriori indicators in Phoenix are, is very simple, I think. Um, I don't, maybe it's, the time of computational time are equal to a MATLAB code, I think, but uh, it's very simple to program in Phoenix the, the, the local indicators, at least for uh, uh, a posteriori analysis for agent body problems. Okay. Um, yes, these are very interesting um, results in, in mixed formulations. That is, uh, that was a great uh, place. It took a great place in, in Professor Boffi's paper, the mixed formulations, you know, yes. the two types. And then the last one was interesting. You said it's the, the vorticity formulation. So no. the last one is, so in that case, how did, this you, one. How did you adopt the, the boundary conditions? I mean, um, are they enough? I, I don't think that the, the, I, the boundary, con the homogeneous boundary condition is, is, is uh, let's say sufficient in this setting? Do you do you just accompany your uh, equations with this homogeneous boundary condition for the velocity? Well, um, the incorporation of the boundary condition in this problem uh, is the same as we did in the other formulations. We incorporate a Lagrange multiplier for the pressure and obtain a, this uh, more, bigger uh, size of uh, the, the matrix uh, uh, of the matrix problem. So the, the real problem was here with mixed formulations. We did an experiment with mixed formulations, which works well and it's published in the paper. But the analysis there is, the, is very difficult because the regularity of the solution is not the optimal for, for that setting. Instead, in this, in this one here, the regularity is the same as the pressure uh, velocity formulation as always. So the incorporation of this um, uh, boundary condition in, in the mathematical analysis and the computational ana analysis is not a problem. The problem is with the mixed formula, mixed boundary. Yes, 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 obviously. Uh, if we have questions, I can uh, stop for a, yes, uh, I think Dr. Yujal is going to ask. Yes, Amdullah Hoca. Okay, thank you, Felipe, first of all. Uh, thank you. I, I want to ask for the second part, a posterior analysis. Okay. okay. As a, first of all, you use the maximum uh, for the uh, for the marking. Why don't you prefer bulk criteria? Is there any reason? No, I mean, we actually we didn't think in that. We use the standard um, uh, setting for, um, for for the source problems. Okay, 
And I, I know that there is another algorithm for the a posterior analysis by the blue green, I think, is yeah. one and, and the, oh, and the others. But we prefer to do what, what, what was done for the a posterior analysis on the source problem, actually. Okay. And also, secondly, uh, when I, when I, as I see for the effective index, is uh, a bit uh, smaller than one. What's that reason? Because our expectation in a posterity uh, effective index, of course, depending on the definition, but should be close to one. Here, mm -hmm. okay, there is no problem in terms of to the uh, robustness of to the new, but it seems a bit smaller. In your computation, do you include data oscillations? For the marking, uh, no, I, I I don't know that part because I didn't compute this. That, ah, that okay. was that, that was uh, Jesus in this case. Okay, in terms of the robustness for uh, for the news, okay, but uh, of course we expect that the relation between the estimator or indicator and uh, error should be close. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, robust is okay, but closeness. Uh, I am a bit surprised because of that. I want to ask. Maybe ah, you okay. don't include the data oscillations. No, maybe, we didn't. Okay, maybe that's the reason you rated it there. Because as I see in your comp uh, estimator, you have the extra term on the right side of the reliability. Maybe that can be reason for this computer. I have, but I am not sure, of course. Ah, of course, we, we we can check also that because. Uh, that's a very nice question of a, for a referee <laughs> for a, uh, of a paper. So that, that, that's an, an interesting question to do, to do and of course to answer. Uh, okay. and at this moment, I cannot <laughs> give you an, a correct answer. I, I will okay, no it. problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, before, uh, since you are talking about here and uh, as I'm not familiar with the a posteriori analysis, I missed the most important uh, property of the post-processing operators. You said that it is, it has to- uh, Here, this one. Uh, yes, 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 I, I missed that. So what is the crucial part in, the, in this uh, post-processing operator? In fact, it's this part, the, the, the first item here, because you need to control this term, okay? Because yeah. in the local indicator appears again, instead, of appearing the lambda h u minus lambda u in L2 norm per element, okay? That's the idea to, to consider this post-processing. That term doesn't appear. And if it appears, the idea is to use the Duran, Padra, Rodriguez uh, approach of the consider an uh, equivalent non-conforming method for another problem, okay? So, it, since you need to bound this term, you need exactly this one here. What is the problem with the, this post-processing? I see, I see a little uh, problem here that this uh, post-processing operator is defined for this patch, but patch of triangles, for example, not for any polygon. Okay, so if you want to use this approach in, for instance, the virtual element method is not to, too straightforward to consider this thing here because it's defined only at least for triangles. Yes, yes, yes. So that was going to my next question. Uh, what, what conditions you are working with or what assumptions you have because it's not very obvious to see that uh, definition. No, no it's, actually it's, it's not so obvious because this idea, uh, what we found this idea in a paper of uh, Professor Voffi, Castaldi, and Rodriguez, and Sebastova for Maxwell, uh, for the a posteriori error for Maxwell equations. Uh, we, I think Gonzalo and I, we took two months to understand why they do that. <laughs> because it's very difficult, it's not so obvious how this operator uh, works and why it's needed. Then we find the, again the paper of Duran and say, ah, maybe this is the reason why and, and all things. We try to do, the, we, we try to implement this, uh, um, the, this post processing operator for VM, but we realize that we cannot because of the polygons and, and, all, and all that. So the only thing that I can answer so far is this is the operator that allows us to not consider the non conforming method 
instead for the control of the high order terms. And this tool here of the post-processing operator is the it's a tool of fashion right now in making value problems with, with a posteriori analysis. I see. Okay, uh, thank you very much once again. The, the no, thank you, Ander, for your invitation and everyone who connected here. And thank, thanks, thanks a lot for uh, all these uh, interesting contributions and uh, for this, for putting them in a very nice way as today's talk. Um, well, so thanks again for um, seeing you virtually, at least virtually at this moment, accepting our talk. Yes. And um, we hope to see you, of course, sometime in, in Turkey, in person. Of course.